before we can talk about the earliest humans in the fossil record we need to understand the changes that bipedalism brings about Although scientists originally assumed that a big brain would be the first characteristic that set humans apart from the great apes, what we found was that the first characteristic that set us apart was bipedal locomotion, not brain size. So in the following slides, to illustrate the skeletal characteristics of bipedalism, I frequently compare the first nearly complete fossil human that was discovered, Australopithecus, to modern humans and to chimps or gorillas. Some major changes are associated with bipedalism, and these changes are found throughout the body, including the proportional lengths of various body segments. Human legs are much longer. For example, the human thigh consists of 20% of the body height of a human, but in a gorilla, only 11%. When you compare the upper arm or humerus on the left hand side in each set of pictures to the femur or thigh on the right hand side, you can see that in the gorilla the arm is longer than the thigh, and in the chimpanzee they are of nearly equal length, but in the humans the leg is longer than the arms. Now one problem with the comparison I just showed you is that for a long time, we thought that the last common ancestor for gorilla, chimpanzee, bonobo, and human was a knuckle walker. But now we think that that ancestor was arboreal and that knuckle walking among the chimp, bonobo, and gorillas began after humans split away. The newest find of a fossil ape human dryopithecine in Germany in 2019 resulted in the proposal of a new model upon which bipedalism was built. This model is called extended limb clambering. This is based upon the idea that a common ancestor to the apes and humans was arboreal, but already upright, using both legs and arms equally. So to look at the characteristics that accompany bipedalism, let's start with the head and move down toward the feet. The head in a bipedal human is balanced on top of an erect spinal column. Where the spine enters the skull is a large hole called the foramen magnum. These are Latin words. Foramen means hole and magnum means big, hole big. You can see that in a human, it's more or less centered in the base of the skull, whereas in a gorilla, it enters at the back of the skull. Here are photographs showing on the right a human foramen magnum more or less in the center of the skull and a gorilla cast on the left with the foramen magnum toward the back. Moving on down, the human spine has an S-shaped curve, which shortened the overall length of the torso and gave rigidity and balance when standing. In contrast, apes have a relatively straight spine. Also, the sacrum, or tailbone, is in line on the, ache, on the ape, but is not. It's more set back in the humans. The pelvis looks quite different between a bipedal Australopithecus and human compared to a chimpanzee or gorilla. Among the bipedal uh, locomotors, the pelvis is very bowl-shaped. It's short and broad. The ilia flare out and, and cup inward, creating a bowl. Whereas in the chimpanzee and gorilla, the pelvis is long, elongated. In the pictures on the bottom, the boxes represent the length and breadth of the iliac blade. And you can see that in the bipedal locomotors, that is very wide and not very tall. So it's very broad. Whereas in the uh, quadruped, it is very long, very tall and narrow. And the red line shows the weight transmission line. 
when you compare the base of the spine to the location of the hip socket or acetabulum you see that in bipedal humans these two are very close together whereas in the ape they are very far apart human upper legs angle inward from the hips to the knees which effectively centers the knees to better support the body during upright walking the legs of apes, on the other hand, are positioned almost straight down from the hip, so that when an ape walks upright for a short distance, its body has to sway from side to side. Now these angles also affect the lower leg, or the tibia. You can note that the human lower leg is more or less vertical, whereas the ape lower leg slopes outward from the foot to the knee. Here you see a dashed line dropping straight down vertically from the hip socket. On the human, on the right hand side, you can see that that then passes through more or less the outside of the knee because the thigh is sloping in so much toward the knee. Whereas on the chimpanzee, it comes straight down on the inside of the knee. Here again is another illustration showing the angle of the thigh. Assuming that the pelvis is on the left-hand side, you can see that in the bipedal walkers, the human and the Australopithecus afarensis, the, the thigh is sloping inward toward the knee, whereas in the chimpanzee, it is nearly vertical. Now this extends then to make changes in the knee. On the right, you see a bipedal knee, and on the left, a quadrupedal knee. One of the differences you'll see is in the size of the lateral condyles, how they look about the same in the um, chimpanzee, but quite different in the um, sloping, inward sloping thigh of a bipedal walker. Not surprisingly, the muscles must also change. When we look at the muscles that extend the hip, in humans, the gluteus maximus attachment is farther back on the hip bone. In chimps, the hamstrings are further back in the back of the knee. Also, the center of gravity is quite different. The center of gravity for humans is in the middle of the pelvis. However, in a chimpanzee, it is more or less in the lower stomach. One of the biggest differences that we see in a fully bipedal hominin is the foot. The foot becomes very specialized for bipedal walking. The big toe is no longer divergent, it's in line, and the entire foot and the toes are less prehensile. So the shorter and less flexible toes provide a rigid lever for pushing off from the ground with each step. Along with that is a very uh, large heel, but the short less flexible toes do not help in climbing trees. On the left hand side you can see a chimpanzee foot at the top versus a human foot on the right and you can see that the human foot has, an, has two arches. Here one, the lengthwise one, is illustrated. You can also see the outline of the footprints that the two different feet would make. The one with the divergent toe and the one with the toes in line. And then the little inset boxes at the bottom, you can see that a baby chimpanzee riding on its mother's back can also use its hind feet to hang on to its mother's fur, whereas a human infant cannot. So the human foot has a double arch, that is an arch that goes lengthwise and an arch that goes across the foot, whereas ape feet do not have arches. Also, the human foot has a very strong heel bone and again, short inline toes. The Australopithecus afarensis foot had arches typical of bipedal locomotion. So finding just a single toe bone, the fourth metatarsal, shows us that the longitudinal arch was present in this foot. And the footprints of Australopithecus in wet ash are more similar to modern human footprints with the toes nearly in line, 
than they are to ape footprints with the toe, big toe, widely divergent. Now moving away from locomotion, uh, or at least uh, the lower limb lo locomotions, we can see that humans have an unusually long and powerful thumb compared to the length of the fingers. And the result is that we have great opposability. That is, we can easily pick up Cheerios. Whereas apes, like the chimpanzee, have long, powerful fingers, sometimes curving over for ease of grasping branches, and a relatively weak thumb, with the result that they have less opposability than we do. Now, the earliest bipedal hominin fossils we have still show adaptation to climbing in trees. For example, some, like Artipithecus ramidus, still have a divergent big toe and a very flexible foot. And even Australopithecus afarensis, who seemed to walk pretty much like a human, still had curved fingers like an ape. Curved fingers would work well for climbing in trees. So what this list of characteristics adds up to is that sometimes finding even just a single bone can tell you that that hominin was bipedal. So when do we see the first bipedal hominins and what evidence do we have? Well, remember, this change seems to have occurred during a time when we have very few fossil primate localities, during the fossil gap from eight to six million years ago. But working back in time, between 3.9 and 3 million years ago, we have a large collection, including one nearly complete skeleton of a bipedal hominin. At 3.7 million years ago, we see bipedal footprints in wet volcanic ash in Eastern Africa. Between 4.2 to 3.9 million years ago, we have one partial femur and both ends of a tibia that are typical of bipedal locomotion. At 4.4 million years ago, we have much of the skeleton of Artipithecus ramidus, who was bipedal, but not like us. And moving back in time, our information becomes a lot more sketchy. 5.8 to 5.2 million years ago, we have one big toe bone. And between 6.2 to 5.6 million years ago, we have teeth and leg bone fragments. And finally, dating between seven to six million years ago, one partial skull. I'm not going to talk about these first bipedal hominins today. We'll talk about them next time. But Lucy, the nickname for a specimen of Australopithecus afarensis, was the first fossil discovered with much of the skeleton attack, intact. She dates to 3.9 to 3 million years ago and was found in Eastern Africa. All of this raises the question, why did bipedalism arise? Why was it adaptive? For a long time, anthropologists pointed to environmental factors, and we do still think that environmental factors played a big role. So in other words, uh, environmental factors drove natural selection. About 8 million years ago, the Great Rift Valley in East Africa began to form, began to pull apart. And east of the valley became savannas and woodlands compared to the tropical rainforest that had been there. And some of the early humans may have become isolated from some of the early great apes. At least eight different models have been proposed for the evolution of bipedalism. That is, trying to come up with ways in which bipedalism would be adaptive. Many of these are based on the idea that the earliest humans arose in savannas when the woodlands went away and people were in mostly grassy savannas with scattered trees. We now know that the earliest humans we have are found in woodlands, but some of these ideas that are uh, given in the models can still apply to being adaptive. The first one is called the caring model, that bipedalism frees arms from its role in walking and instead allows you to carry items. 
Having your arms free would allow you to carry food for longer distances and with greater efficiency. You could also carry an infant, or you could carry weapons such as stones or sticks to scare off predators. A second is the vigilance model in which bipedalism allows for the head to be elevated. And so if you're out in tall grass, you could stand up and look over the grass and see whether any predators are coming. The heat dissipation model says that bipedalism allows the body to cool more efficiently. So in a hot savanna environment, standing upright exposes less of your body surface area to the sun and allows more heat to escape and allows your body to be exposed to cooling breezes. This is illustrated here, showing how much more of your body surface is hit by the direct rays of the sun when you're quadrupedal or knuckle walking versus when you're upright. The fourth model proposed is energy efficient model, saying that bipedalism is an energy efficient form of walking and that walking long distances to acquire food would require less energy when you're bipedal. However, this probably was not actually a major factor in the evolution of bipedalism because the fossils indicate that the earliest bipedal humans walk differently and less efficiently than do modern humans. A fifth idea is the foraging bipedal harvesting model saying that bipedalism allowed early humans to reach food in otherwise inaccessible places. Now that we know that humans or at least the earliest fossils that we found were found in wooded areas, not in grassy areas, we can reinvent this model to cover upright behavior up in the trees, that is standing on branches to reach for food up above you. The sixth model is called the display model, saying that bipedalism allowed males to better compete with one another for dominance. This is one model that links bipedalism to reproductive success, pointing to how modern day chimpanzees stand upright to display dominance and rise in the dominance hierarchy. And a higher position in the dominance hierarchy could lead to greater access to mates. It is interesting that bipedalism seems to be linked to smaller, blunter canines with less shear power. When you compare modern human canines on the left, they're relatively small, to a modern chimp canines on the right, very large, to Artipithecus ramidus canines, kind of midway in between there in the center. We believe then that this size change in the canines indicates that some social behavior must have changed. This led to the vested provisioning model, which states that females preferred non-aggressive males who gained reproductive success by obtaining copulation in exchange for valuable foods, that is for vested provisioning. This model has three changes. One, that the males would regularly carry food. Two, that there would be pair bonding between a male and a female, and that females would not on the outside show when they were ovulating, unlike say modern day chimpanzees who have a large swollen red area that signals to everyone that they are ovulating. Lovejoy who proposed this says that together these behaviors would have substantially intensified male parental investment. And the most recently proposed model is the complex topography model, which takes into account the beginnings of the Rift Valley in Eastern Africa. It states that instead of the lessening of trees in the changing environment, we need to focus on the development of cliffs and gorges. And early humans would have been attracted to this rugged landscape because cliffs could offer shelter. You could, you could climb up a cliff to escape predators or sleep up there at night. And they would also give you an opportunity to trap prey by driving them over the cliff. But to be able to take advantage of this rugged landscape, you need to be able to scramble around bipedally. 
Only later, long after the initial bipedal locomotion began, would the hominins be adapted to good running ability that could help them on excursions out into the flat plains for food and to seek new home ranges. So which model is the best? Each model has criticism and each has support. And most likely, numerous factors played a part in the evolution of bipedalism.